Upon Mike Vickers' retirement from federal service on April 30, 2015, President Obama wrote, Your storied career has become legend in the national security community. From your leading role in the 1980s as the principal strategist for the program that defeated the Red Army in Afghanistan and accelerated the end of the Cold War, to your leadership in devising the strategy that would disrupt, dismantle, and defeat core Al-Qaeda in the Pakistan border region, and your key role in planning for the operation that brought justice to Osama bin Laden. For 42 years, you have had a knack for being precisely where our nation needed you most. One of our nation's top practitioners of unconventional warfare and counterterrorism, Mike has received the nation's highest awards in the fields of intelligence and defense, including the Presidential National Security Medal, one of the four top awards that General Donovan himself received. Growing up in Hollywood, Mike was a sports-crazed kid with dreams of playing in the big leagues. But late in high school, another dream started to take hold. I was an often irregular student, very focused on sports, and I had a high school international relations professor who handed me a New York Times article one day about the CIA's big program in Laos during the Vietnam War and said, you might be interested in this. And it started me thinking about special forces and CIA. Mike's sports dream was shattered when actor Mark Harmon beat him out for the starting quarterback position at a local community college. Unfazed, Mike was now free to pursue what turned out to be his true passion. I wanted to be a CIA officer and I thought Special Forces was the best preparation. I wanted something that combined real physical adventure across a range of areas, a lot of intellectual challenges, really difficult problems to solve. Shortly after joining the Green Berets, Mike received the Special Forces Soldier of the Year Award, studied Soviet weapons and tactics, and became an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I was trained initially in U.S. and foreign weapons of, of all kinds. It came in very handy later in my career. And then an unconventional warfare, where you put it all together and learn how to be guerrillas behind enemy lines. He also trained to carry a small atomic bomb. A few Special Forces operators were trained for very special missions with small atomic weapons that could be carried in a rucksack to blow a bridge that couldn't be done with conventional explosives to stop the Soviet advance on Europe. Soon thereafter, Mike was selected for Officer Candidate School. He went right back into the Special Forces, graduating at the top of his Special Forces Officer course. As a First Lieutenant, he was selected for early command of a special counterterrorism intelligence unit, where he led sensitive intelligence collection operations and participated in two hostage rescue operations. After 10 years in the Green Berets, Mike Vickers finally fulfilled his dream of joining the CIA, and at age 31, he was given the assignment of a lifetime. The most consequential of the operational phase of my career was as the principal strategist and program officer for what was called the Afghan Covert Action Program. It was the largest of its kind in the history of the CIA. That was like the World Series of Unconventional Warfare, something that I had prepared for for uh, over a decade. The opportunity to fight our main Cold War enemy, it was the professional experience of a lifetime. Which one of the guys do you think is a strategic weapons expert with the CIA? Huh. That was a trick question, Charlie. It's a nerdy looking kid in the white shirt. The covert war in Afghanistan and the role Mike Vickers played in it was immortalized in the book and hit movie, Charlie Wilson's War. Mike Vickers, this is Congressman Charles Wilson of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. And a Swiss made Orlick an STA anti aircraft cannon. That's what you'd use to shoot down the MI 24 hind gun ship in the mountains, right? Well, the Orlickans are a good start, but the Russians will just start flying higher altitude missions. So, what else would they need? Same thing you give us AK 47s, AK 74s, AK MS. Soviets didn't come in Afghanistan on a Ural rail pass. They came in T 55 tanks. The fighters need RPG 7 anti tank grenade launchers, Kat Yusha 107 millimeter rockets, wire mines, plastic mines, bicycle bombs, sniper rifles, ammunition for all the above, and frequency hopping radios and burst transmitters. So, these guys are so easy to find. I've written it all in a report you can read. Courtesy of Congressman Charlie Wilson, the program budget had increased by a factor of four, 
And there was a lot of angst in the CIA about a program that had gotten so big so fast. And we were also engaged in another insurgency in Central America. And so there was a strategy debate about where our main effort should be. Could we win in Afghanistan or was this really just to bleed the Soviets? Were all these resources justified that essentially Congress had imposed on the CIA? And so my initial challenge was to convince people that this really should be the main effort and that the resources were not only justified, but that we could use more. With the strong support of Bert Dunn and Gustav Rokatos, Vickers supervisors in the Near East and South Asia Division, might carry the day. Within a year, the budget had increased by a factor of 11, and that's really where it stayed for the rest of the war. In March 1985, in National Security Decision Directive 166, President Reagan approved Mike Vicker's plan to drive the Soviets out of Afghanistan by all means available. The new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, escalated the Soviet effort in Afghanistan at the same time, sending in an additional 26,000 troops, moving his top general from the Central Front in Europe to Afghanistan and giving him a year to win the war. 1985 was the decisive year of the war. The Afghan resistance and the CIA won the Battle of the Surges. By February 1986, the Soviets began looking for the exit. President Reagan's decision in March 1986 to begin supplying the Afghan resistance with the Stinger anti-aircraft missile helped ensure that the Soviets didn't change their minds. Once his strategy had been fully implemented, Mike came to the realization that he had fought the great war of his time and it would likely be a long time before he received another assignment of such strategic import. Mike decided to leave CIA to continue his education, first at the Wharton School and then at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. I decided to do a PhD and I co-founded a think tank advising the Pentagon on strategy and it started the shift from my career from being an operator, a special operator and CIA operations officer to a national security policy maker and then an intelligence community leader. After advising President Bush on a new strategy for the Iraq war, the president selected Mike as his assistant secretary of defense for special operations, low intensity conflict and interdependent capabilities, a new position that was created for Mike that gave him policy oversight over all special operations forces, the nation's nuclear arsenal and conventional force transformation. With Admiral Olson and others, Mike conceived of and led the largest expansion of special operations forces capability and capacity in our nation's history. He also drove major new investments in long range air power and undersea warfare that significantly increased our military's ability to project power against future potential great power rivals. We not only had the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, but we had the global fight against Al-Qaeda, and so we needed a significant expansion of the force. Our special operations forces, within the span of a decade, SOCOM had doubled in personnel, tripled in budgets, and quadrupled in deployments. In 2007 to 2008, Mike played a central role in designing the plan and obtaining President Bush's approval for a more aggressive campaign against core Al-Qaeda in the Pakistan border region. The results were dramatic. By the end of 2010, multiple Al-Qaeda senior leaders had been eliminated, and Osama bin Laden ordered the organization to go to ground in an attempt to survive the onslaught. In August 2010, President Obama nominated Mike to serve as the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, the Chief Executive Officer of the Defense Intelligence Enterprise, an $80 billion, 180,000 person global operation. Shortly after the Senate confirmed him, Mike played a critical role in the mission to bring justice to Osama bin Laden. It's been said that finding Osama bin Laden is one of the greatest intelligence operations in history, and it really was. It was something that was 10 years in the making, going from clue to clue to finally locate him in Abbottabad. In the final days before the operation, Mike helped convince Secretary Gates that a daring raid to kill bin Laden was the right course of action. Secretary Gates had been in the White House during the Iran rescue attempt and had saw what could happen when things go wrong. So he initially had favored an airstrike, which had the advantages of being less complex, 
but also more collateral damage. Innocent people would get killed and we wouldn't have the proof if we got him. In our final meeting with the president, Secretary Gates still thought that an airstrike was the better option. The next morning, myself, my colleague, the Undersecretary for Policy, Michelle Flournoy, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Mullen, went to see him, and we had all believed that the raid was the right way to go. Secretary Gates had a very open mind and listened to the arguments and then called the President's National Security Advisor and said he recommended the raid. As the USDI, in addition to continuing to oversee operations worldwide, Mike conceived and led the most comprehensive transformation of defense intelligence in history. He oversaw a several order of magnitude increase in the speed and capacity of the global signals intelligence system and drove a more than 11-fold increase in the size of the nation's unmanned armed intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance fleet capabilities that have proven critical in the wars against al-Qaeda and the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. We've used these very, very effectively. The basic idea is to use our technology, our unmanned aircraft where we can, our special operations forces, our intelligence, our network of global partners, intelligence and security services and militaries we work with, in some cases tribes. All that fits together to try to defeat these groups and stabilize these regions. Planning well into the future, Mike Vickers drove a fundamental redesign of the nation's overhead space architecture that will result in dramatic improvements in persistence, integrated operations, and survivability. A major reconceptualization and restructuring of DOD's strategic human intelligence service that has significantly improved the department's ability to collect intelligence against hard targets and a major buildup of our cyber forces. And throughout his tenure as Assistant Secretary and Undersecretary, Mike forged an unprecedented partnership between DOD and the CIA in operations and in the development of new capabilities. Congratulations, Mike, on receiving the Donovan Award. I'm confident that General Donovan would be extraordinarily pleased to see you receiving this award uh, named in his honor. Because in many respects, you are the quintessential OSS officer, non-commissioned, commissioned officer in the Special Forces, CIA clandestine service officer, PhD in international relations, equally adept in either a graduate seminar or a bar fight. You and I started working together more than 30 years ago on Afghanistan. And you would brief me every week when I was Deputy Director of Central Intelligence on how we were doing against the Soviets. Well, we ended up doing pretty well. I was therefore very pleased when the opportunity came that I could recommend you to the President to be the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. I joined CIA 51 years ago and I don't believe I've ever known an intelligence officer for whom I had more respect than I have for you or anyone more deserving of this award. Again, Mike, congratulations. It is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to uh, share in this wonderful evening in recognizing my friend and colleague of many years, Dr. Mike Vickers. Mike is a uh, tremendous friend and a great professional associate. And in my mind, he, he represents a unique amalgam or combination of what OSS stands for and the spirit of OSS, that is special operations and intelligence. Mike, throughout his professional life, has distinguished himself in both those realms. And so I think this award, the Donovan Award, fits Mike to a T. And it is a great honor and privilege for me to be here to help recognize my good friend, Mike Vickers. Mike, congratulations. Mike, I'm sorry I can't be there tonight. I can't think of anyone more deserving of the Donovan Award than you. In fact, I can't think of anybody that really personifies the Donovan Award more than you do. Your time in Special Forces, your time as a CIA officer, your time in the Pentagon as ASD Solik and as USDI, this is what the Donovan Award was made for. And Mike, I want to thank you for the great friendship that we have had over these many, many years. I look back on my time in special operations, particularly the last uh, seven or eight years of my time in the Navy, 
and nothing, absolutely nothing we did wouldn't have happened without Mike Vickers. Mike, congratulations on receiving the Donovan Award. God bless you, and make sure you raise a martini glass for me. Mike Vickers, the 2017 William J. Donovan Award recipient.